O oh, spring, how we've missed you. Stir us from our slumber. Blow away the dark storms of winter with your gentle breezes so we can see again the mountains of challenge that inspire us to climb higher. They've been here all winter, but we've been inside. The promise of change is all around. May we reach the new beginning with renewed energy and freedom. Good morning to all and welcome to the North Chapel's virtual Sunday service on this day, April 18th. I am Mary Jean Taylor and as always, I am honored to be part of your visit with us as we continue this month's theme of healing ourselves. I found the words I opened with in my service coordinator's notes from the mid 2000s and then as now, they remain anonymous, though they capture just what I am thinking today. Last week, when Roly spoke of the healing powers of this place, I knew that today I had to come here to welcome you all in. Throughout this time when we have met virtually, it has helped me to just drive by our beloved North Chapel. And while being here by the river in the backyard of our church or passing by feels like only a wisp of wonder as compared to sitting in our beautiful sanctuary with all of you, it does still stir my heart just to be close. It makes me feel nearer to you, too. I hope this day finds you and yours well, with your own heart and soul feeling hopeful with the promise of spring. I will add that as much as I miss our time under the roof of our church, there is a lovely ease to virtual church, don't you think? We can attend in our jammies, and at any time of the day or week, and we can sing out loud to our heart's content, never worrying about whether or not we are actually carrying the tune. If you haven't been to church in a bit, I would suggest you meet Mabel from the April 4th Easter service, and that you watch last week's service to see Diane's most lovely capturing of the past year. Of course, you will also be graced with the added benefits of our wonderful Reverend Dr. Leon Dunkley's reflections and hearing welcomes, music, and poetry from other friends. You can find links to past services, post-church coffee gatherings, and lots more on our website, www.northchapelvt.org. Give it a look. Today, we welcome Simon Dennis, Director of the Center for Transformational Practice to our virtual pulpit and look forward with our gratitude to that which he will share. As many of you know, April rarely feels truly springy in Vermont. So this year, with many days of sun and warmth, it is as if the earth knows how much we need it after a winter made longer by all that COVID has brought our way. These days bring much anticipation including the thought of the time when we will return and walk through our front doors of church. Until then, like all good things worth waiting for, we cross our fingers and look ahead. In closing, may I offer you these words by Reverend Kendra Ford, a UU minister from just down the road in Exeter, New Hampshire. April wind. Branches crack and fall. High wind cleans the trees of winter weight. Unburden yourself. Let the wind ride through you. Open your mouth. Let the spring wind blow every word down the alleys and into the fields. Let loose your dead wood. Bloom small in the mud. Wishing you love, health, peace, and whatever healing your body, heart, and soul are in need of. As you surely know, some of the very best medicine comes from music. So let's sing, shall we? Just as loudly as you like. Our opening hymn is Sounds Over All Water.
Hello, my name is Laura Foley. I'm here on a hillside in South Pomfret, Vermont on an April day. I'm thinking about feeling concerned for some loved ones who are not well, for the steward of this land, the owner who is, who is also undergoing a health situation this week and I'm sending love to him and his wife. May he be well. Now, I wrote this poem called I Stopped, and it really is about, it was, I wrote it when I had had a heart issue and was undergoing some serious concerns myself. It was like, well, what can I do? What can we do? What are any of us can do? One thing we can do is, is be present when we are here. Be present at this moment. I Stopped. I stopped and turned to see on my periphery what played such a gentle note. Cresting the field's edge full of rustling yellow leaves, a line of twenty or thirty slender poplar trees, the midday sun singling out each one equally. I turned, saw, and listened, knowing that all was good. If today proved to be my last on earth, I would be grateful I had stopped to see the dancing poplar trees, all those jeweled bits of light. Hello everyone, good morning, and thank you for inviting me to share a reflection this morning. I always appreciate it so much. Uh, for me, it's come to be kind of like a form of check-in, like with the 
when at the beginning of a meeting when you get a minute to tell everyone how you're doing. Uh, but this kind of check-in comes around only once every two years, and so I get more time. And uh, it's lovely to be, lovely to reconnect with this community uh, to which I feel bound by ties of friendship. So if I were checking in at a meeting, I would say this has been an interesting couple of weeks for me. Um, my partner Elizabeth has been away in New York. And before she left, uh, I remember she was expressing some concern about how I would do taking care of all of the animals and the uh, making sure the seedlings are watered and everything. And I was a little insulted by her concern, but I did my best to reassure her. And it went along pretty well for a while. Uh, at the beginning of this week, I did something that impacted me so profoundly that, uh, honestly, it made me wonder if I was going to be able to write something down to share with you this morning. At night, a week ago, I left the chicken coop door open. And in the morning, as I walked down across the yard to find the door ajar, I felt the stench of carnage settle around me. I found the ground dusted with feathers, and then our precious birds opened up, or parts of them, half the flock maybe, strewn around the yard. My mind started racing back and forth, unable to accept it unless through crying out, unable to change it or bend reality for, away from the blood and feathers and carnage, fear, regret, humiliation, and uh, a thousand fruitless attempts to somehow make it okay, make it all right. So this week I've been the unconsolable one, like someone who's weeps after hitting an animal on the road. And I've been the perplexed one uh, who quietly wonders why his housemate is so distraught about roadkill. For a while, any natural beauty I saw was a threat as it subconsciously reminded me of the beauty of their feathers, their cooing and clucking conversations. All this and yet I never wept. And my dismay may have been compounded by the thought that I probably wouldn't. I've learned that these chickens will mark me for a while because this event reminds me of having left nine snakes in a cage in the sun. I was 10 years old and how badly I needed them to wriggle away when I returned but only half of them could do, them do this for me. So I carry the others around now and again. More generally speaking, this year, uh, worn out by the pandemic, I'm less enthralled by the lofty narratives I have mentioned in the past. And this has put my work with the Center for Transformational Practice in a funny place. When the quarantine period began, conversations with municipal staff in Hartford about how to find a safe place for unhoused members of our community drifted into a desire on my part to be more hands-on with my life. In time, I made friends with some of Hartford's campers, and in the winter, we built geodesic domes, and the domes morphed into huts, and we built more. I was having a romance with styrofoam, and I learned how to cut it with a hot wire. Together, we placed makeshift micro-homes in interstate rights-of-way and deep in the forest and behind the rail yard. It was an exciting time. We were like snails carrying our houses on our backs. Somewhere along this process, uh, I had a conversation with Hartford's then town manager. I wanted him to help us find a place where people could go legally at night, and my logic was simple. The Upper Valley is 7,000 units short of housing. Uh, 
the shortage has to squeeze some people out the bottom and we have no cold weather shelter in the pandemic during the pandemic and so i said either the town can find a place where people can legally go or it can criminalize them for existing he wanted me to back off and we went back and forth and finally, I asked him if he would go sit around the fire and hear stories from some of the people at an encampment. I told him, when you do that, you're going to end up just like me. I guess that wasn't a good selling point because though he agreed to go, he never did. Meanwhile, I was getting calls from people in urgent need of shelter. And after about a, a year of this, the trouble began. Neighbors complained, political adversaries strategized, and alerted landowners. Words like liability, permitting, permission were thrown around, and I was afraid that I was going to be publicly shamed. When the, fi when the showdown finally came to the select board meeting floor, where I was still sitting at that time, uh, the public was surprisingly supportive, and thankfully, the Valley News, too. After we recalled three huts that were causing most of the problem, the pushback quieted down. Twice, the Hartford Select Board gave a mandate to staff to find a solution. Twice, twice the Hartford staff came back empty-handed, Instead, they made arguments for why it couldn't happen. But they did promise to help with the project if I could fall in line. So I started playing by the rules, and the whole operation migrated to where it is now. Seated within the system, it once tried to change. Since then, uh, progress has almost come to a halt. Um, it had been proven that the problem could be solved, but municipal work, it turns out, happens within a certain state of mind. We could call it a bureaucratic or a frozen state, where for some reason nothing moves. So I often think about what it will take to thaw out this municipal conversation. I think about meeting interventions. Think about silence at the beginning of a meeting or a poem to be read at the beginning of the meeting. But when this works, it's a real challenge to the status quo. And you know what we think about people who do that. We think they're a little off. Uh, they're too bold or out of step. Honestly, I sometimes think this way about a certain friend of mine, Carolyn Griffin, unabashed as she is, unapologetic, unyielding. Carolyn lives in St. Louis, Missouri, where she leads deeply moving ceremonies in the tradition of one of her teachers, Sobonfu Somme, a woman from Burkina Faso of West Africa. Recently, Carolyn has been re receiving a vision of a ceremony to support us in recovering from our losses from COVID-19. In a Zoom call, she explained the process. The ceremony would involve building a community cairn out of the four stones of the COVID-19 pandemic. And after much pre preparation, Carolyn would finally hold up the first stone and she would proclaim, this stone represents our grief for the loss of our beloved friends and family members we love you and miss your unreplaceable presence in our lives. We particularly mourn the loss of those elders in our communities who we counted on to show the way forward. And Carolyn would go on and then place the stone on the community Karen and retrieve another one and say, this stone represents the sins of this nation first visited upon the indigenous peoples of this land through genocide, colonialism, and greed, and then on the enslaved black people, stolen and shipped across the Americas before landing here, 
having endured hatred, terror, and abuse as a means of building the capital which this country now holds. And this stone, this section would go on as well before she would place it on the Karen. And then select another and continue. This third stone represents the vast loss and suffering due to political corruption. Our nation has failed to prioritize the health and safety of its people. We bemoan that frontline workers have commonly had inadequate protective gear, which has so many times cost their lives. And finally, this fourth stone represents the pain of isolation, both enforced on us and reinforced in our lives. We grieve the isolation caused from being separated during times of crisis when we needed each other most. We grieve for families that have been isolated from elders for fear of infecting them, and for children who lost physical contact and play. And then the ceremony would move into song. Uh, a grief ceremony of this, in this tradition is on, built on the foundation of song, as brought forward by a skillful song leader. One such leader is Carolyn's colleague, Joanna Laws Landis. Like Carolyn, Joanna receives ceremonial elements from time to time, in her case, songs focused on supporting the process of grieving. Joanna has recently been given the song that forms the basis of this ceremony, which immediately follows the placing of the stones. It goes like this. Lay it all down. Lay it all down. Lay it all down. Lay it all down. Lay it all down, lay it all down. You don't have to carry it no more. Lay it all down, lay it all down, lay it all down. Lay it all down, lay it all down, lay it all down. You don't have to carry it no more. And this would continue while the ceremonial participants brought their griefs to the cairn in the middle. Hearing about this process made me wonder if perhaps the stuckness of our frozen mindset is not that we 21st century Americans don't care about one another, but that we do. Not that we are so disconnected from one another, but that we are so connected that we are all struggling under the weight of our own and one another's unexpressed losses. After hearing about these ceremony, this ceremony, I can't help but wonder what we could accomplish if we could hold something of this sort for our grief about our unhoused neighbors, exhausted, struggling to stay alive winter after winter, pillaged by generational, generational abuse, ravaged at times by methamphetamine, and so marginalized by society that many feel completely justified to do everything they can to prevent them from walking on the public sidewalk front of their homes. I bet if we could hold a ceremony to grieve the situation, we would gather the motivation and the forces we have done to have done with forced winter camping for once and for all. For that matter, if we could just hold a ceremony of this sort for all of our losses due to climate change, what sort of movement could we build? And what about my box of snakes? Perhaps I could let their stiff bodies slither off into the grass of my mind. I'd like to do that too. 
it takes a lot of courage to call forward a ceremony based on the wisdom of Western Africa or to read a poem in a municipal hall or just to admit how much we grieve our losses. It takes a lot of courage to disrupt everyone's expectations and demonstrate ways to dwell more deeply. And people will look down on us when we do. We'll lose credibility in high places. But people will also thank us, as I'm proud of my friends Joanna and Carolyn for bringing forward these old forms at this time when they're so dearly needed. Without these sorts of disruptions, I don't think anything can move forward. But with them, I think we'd be able to do the work we need to do. Thank you. Yeah.